Behind me is 14,410 foot Mount Rainier in the Cascade Mountain Range. It's a relatively young mountain that's been shaped by volcanic activity, climate, and by glaciers. Let's see. It says here, glaciers are large bodies of ice and snow that show evidence of movement. They can carve whole valleys. So I guess glaciers are icy movers and shapers. You know, ever since Greg left for Mount Rainier, which is covered with glaciers, I wanted to learn more about them too. I've got an idea. Let's check in with him to see how things are going. Okay. There he is. Hey gang, how you doing? We're okay, how about you? I'm doing great. Just a little bit cold up here though. Nice and warm here in the bait shop. We were just saying, we wanted to learn more about glaciers. Hey, let's take a video tour of Mount Rainier and its glaciers. Sounds great. Lead on, Greg. We'll stay tuned here in the warm bait shop. It's good to see you, Chris. Tell me about Mount Rainier. Well, Mount Rainier, um, basically, in a nutshell, it's a volcano. It's a huge straddle volcano. 14,410 feet above sea level. It's massive. It's covered with glaciers. Well, Mount Rainier has more glaciers on it than any other single peak in the United States. And it has more glacial ice in it than every single other of the Cascade volcanoes put together. As Mount Rainier had many, many successive eruptions over hundreds of thousands of years, it grew taller and taller and taller. And the higher up into the atmosphere it poked itself up into, the more it captured the, the cold, moist air is coming off the Pacific Ocean. And so what happens is the snow packs accumulated and that snow compressed into ice, thick, dense ice, becoming a river like the one that we see here. More snow fell on the top of Mount Rainier than could ever melt during the summertime. Now, if you took Safe Gulf Park, where the Seattle Mariners professional baseball club plays, and you screwed a giant handle into it and made it into a huge ice cream scooper, you would have to use that ballpark 2,600 times, 2,600 scoops to dig out all of that glacial ice from the slopes and the flanks of Mount Rainier. Here's some more things I've learned. The ecosystems created by a glacier's presence can range from the breathtaking blue ice capping the active volcano within to the beauty of wildflower meadows that flourish at the foot of mountains using the glacier's deposited soils and meltwater. Wildlife can range from those hardy enough to withstand the ice and cold of the glacier itself to a parade of migrating or hibernating creatures in the meadows. To really appreciate a glacier, you have to consider its sheer force. A glacier can carve up mountaintops forming sharp peaks. In fact, a big part of the lay of the land in America was formed during the last major ice age when the environment was a lot colder. That began a million and a half years ago with the start of the Pleistocene epoch. During this time, four ice sheets formed in the Laurentian Mountains of Canada, advanced as far south as the upper Mississippi River Valley and retreated. Glaciers moving across the ground slowly carved valleys, formed rolling hills and plains, slender lakes, and dramatic scenery. The place you live may not be glacier cold now, but in the Ice Age, it was a different story. And this whole entire area was once probably covered in several hundred feet, a uh, massive sheet of glacial ice, and it got worn off and polished in the smooth sort of hilly undulations you see there. I wonder how a glacier forms. I know there's a lot of ice in polar regions. I wonder if that ice spreads. Maybe heavy snowfalls accumulate. Or maybe it forms in heavy mountain ranges, like the Rockies or the Swiss Alps. Let's see if Greg knows. For the most part, glaciers form when more snow falls than melts. It accumulates in large amounts and turns to ice. The ice can become so large and heavy that the pull of gravity will cause a glacier to slide down a slope. That makes glaciers a moving and ever-changing part of the environment. Have you ever been outside when you dropped a piece of ice? Maybe after you dropped it down someone's shirt and it fell on the ground. If you picked it up, 
you'd notice it's way too dirty to put in your drinking glass or back in the ice chest. That's because of adhesion. The dirt sticks to the melting outside layer of the ice. Well, glaciers are also constantly melting as they move across the dirt. The friction of the ice rubbing on the ground may cause the ice to melt, or the climate could become warmer. That would also melt it. In reacting to the surrounding environment, glaciers advance when snow accumulation is greater than the melt rate and then retreat when it melts. The process is melt and freeze, a very slow way to travel. If some of the glacier melts quickly or there is a sudden release of water that was caught beneath the glacier, it can cause what's called an outburst flood, or the Icelandic term for it is jokaloits. Here's some more glacial terminology. There's what is called the um, terminal moraine, and that's the big pile of rocky rubble debris that the snout of the glacier shoves along, and then when it recedes, it leaves this evidence back uh, of where it once was. This is the snout, or the terminus, of the Nisqually Glacier. We're only seeing just a tiny, tiny little fraction of the glacier, but this is it. Coming out from underneath it is the Nisqually River. This is the source, the beginning of the Nisqually River. One surface feature of glaciers is known as a crevasse. A glacial crevasse is very dangerous for hikers and looks like a big gash in the ice but it's actually a crack caused when the glacier moved over uneven terrain and bent, then split as it tried to accommodate the shape of the land. There's also something called glacial drift. Glacial drift is when rocks are deposited by a melting glacier. Did you know that the 49ers in the California gold rush were panning for gold more than they were mining it? Glaciers in their meltwater had deposited tiny nuggets of gold in the hills where streams washed it within relatively easy reach. Niagara Falls, one of America's best known natural wonders, is also a glacial creation. Check out the island off the coast of New York City. Long Island has made an industry of selling off sand and soil. The island itself was made entirely by glacial activity. There are two types of glaciers, continental and alpine, named for where they form and identified by the features they leave behind. Continental glaciers are formed on an extremely large and flat landmass. They tend to be dome-shaped, thicker in the middle and thinner on the edges where they advance. These smooth flowing plains were caused by continental glaciers. And there can be glaciers on mountains like Mount Rainier too. Those types of glacial landscapes are called alpine, meaning they form in high elevations. With the help of gravity pulling them down, they create mountain valleys. Alpine glaciers can turn V-shaped river valleys into broad U-shaped ones. Well, this is the White River Valley, and this beautiful valley is so clearly and obviously a glacial valley. How can you tell that? Notice it's beautiful U-shaped. If it was carved or eroded away by the White River down in its bottom, it would be V-shaped. So at one time, the Emmons Glacier, the largest glacier on Mount Rainier, indeed the largest glacier in the continental United States, flowed all the way down this valley. It has since retreated. As the glacier travels down the valley, it bulldozes rock and debris off towards its two sides, and then also rock fall from the slopes above it, tumble on top of the glacier, creating a thick, insulating bed of rock, debris, and rubble on top of the glacier itself. Now, the glacier doesn't move very fast as compared to a river of water. Um, the, some of these glaciers average about, say, 10 inches of movement per a day, or maybe as little as two inches, but on some really, really hot summer days, they might rush forward up to two feet. Chris, thanks for the information. So, continental and alpine are the two major types of glacial landscapes. I read that glaciers can also create lakes. The Great Lakes and New York's Finger Lakes were formed by a massive continental ice sheet. Today, Alaska has America's biggest collection of glaciers. In Alaska's Denali National Park, Mount McKinley rises higher than any other mountain in North America. It's over 20,000 feet high. Freezing temperatures keep the area's countless glaciers from melting. 
Some of these glaciers are 30 or 40 miles long. Glaciers are found on every continent except A, Africa, B, South America, C, North America, or D, Australia. Besides identifying where glaciers are located, it's also useful to know what's inside a glacier. Last week, I went to the Ice Core Center in Buffalo, New York. Let's check out some footage from that visit. Dr. Kenton Stewart does research on frozen lakes throughout the world. Ice is a feature in northern latitudes. It's on lakes, it's on streams, and if you record it over many, many years, you get some index of the change in climate. Based on the studies that we've done uh, of several lakes around the world, we find that the average freezing date is now later. So the winter, in a sense, is getting shorter, and that's the trend that we see from several lakes and some rivers around the world. The most obvious reason that we can come up with is this is the global climate change, global warming. And some climatologists might look at changes in, say, tree rings or something over several hundred years, or possibly in terms of glaciers over a few thousand years. And that's exactly what Dr. Michael Rahm studies, glacial ice. An ice sheet is basically uh, a dome-shaped glacier. And uh, this dome-shaped glacier flows out in all directions. There are two ice sheets in the world. One of them is the Greenland ice sheet, which is in the northern hemisphere on an island called Greenland. And the other one is in the southern hemisphere. Uh, it's the Antarctic ice sheet. It's in Antarctica. The job of the scientists is to study what is in the ice to determine, to be able to evaluate climate change over time and so on. A group of drillers go in and they drill into the ice sheet and remove a core of ice. The technology that I used in my lab to study the core sample was called laser light scattering. What is in the ice is a reflection of what was in the past atmosphere or in the atmosphere at the time of, that the snow was deposited. Determining the age of the ice is very important. And you can do it, for instance, by observing the changes in dust concentration. Some of the Greenland ice core samples are almost 200,000 years old. Studying dust particles and microorganisms found in glaciers from long ago helps scientists identify past climatic trends that may be important indicators for the future. And the answer to that tackle box brain teaser is, glaciers are found on every continent except D, Australia. That sound is ice cracking or calving. That's the way icebergs are formed. As the edge of a glacier advances into rough water, it cracks and a piece falls off. Many of them are humongous. Even though all we can see above water is just about 10% of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg. Here's a cool, and I mean cool demo of how ice can break rock. When water in this bottle freezes, it expands and breaks the bottle. In the same way, as water with a glacier freezes and expands, it can break off pieces of ice and rock. Wow, it says here that if all the land ice in the world melted, it would raise the sea level 70 meters, flooding cities like Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Miami, and parts of Boston. Holy mackerel! But not all glacial activity is considered destructive. In Tacoma, Washington, the city harnesses some of Mount Rainier's glacial meltwater for recreation and for hydroelectric power. What is the dam right here? This is Alder Lake Dam with the Alder Lake Reservoir behind it. Could you explain the relationships between the glaciers on Mount Rainier and Alder Dam? Well, there are several glaciers on Mount Rainier. One of them, the Nisqually Glacier, forms the headwaters of the Nisqually River, which feeds this lake uh, year-round. During the colder, wetter winters, the glacier builds up in size as the snows are deposited up on Mount Rainier. And you don't think of ice as being full of energy, but it is a great deal of potential energy that sits up there waiting for us to use. Eventually, all that water will melt. It will find its way down into this reservoir, and we'll get to use a little bit of that potential energy as electricity down in the city of Tacoma. How do you use water to create energy? We save that water at a higher elevation, and as it drops down to a lower elevation, we take the energy out of the water using turbines and generators. 
that baseball diamond in your hometown very likely contains glacial clay trucked in. Let me show you another interesting use of some glacially deposited material. Hi, I'm Greg Brandy. Hi, I'm Jane Gardner. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I hear there's something special about the pottery y'all make here. Um, we do use as a glaze some of the glacial flour, and glacial flour is the fine particles of rock that the glaciers, as the glaciers slowly move down Mount Rainier, they grind the rock or the mountain into very, very fine particles. You can see it in the Nisqually River. It looks very cloudy and settles into Alder Lake. And that's when my husband and I, usually my husband, goes down and gets the silt or the flour that settles to the bottom of the lake. These are the pots that are glazed with the glacial flour. Great. And that's what gives it the, the color? Yes, there's iron, and that's the predominant coloring agent in it. And we dip the pot into the big bucket of silt that's mixed with water, and it coats the pot. And then I fire it in a kiln to 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. And that melts it, and it fuses with the pot. And after it's cool, it's ready to use. Glaciers can also be very beautiful. Nearly 2 million people every year view the grandeur and beauty of Mount Rainier National Park. Visitors flock to see the glaciers and their unique wildlife. Those glaciers also attract climbers looking for a unique adventure. Mount Rainier National Park sees approximately 1.5, 1.8 million visitors each year. Of those, about 11,000 attempt to climb to the top of Mount Rainier. We've had the Mountaineering Guide Service for about 32 years, and we take folks up uh, to the top of Mount Rainier. Do the glaciers on Mount Rainier help to attract more climbers? Well, that's a good question, and I think that um, Rainier attracts climbers because of its snow and ice and because of the glaciers. Approximately 60 to 70 percent of our customers come from out of state, so an awful lot of them have come to travel specifically to Washington to get on the glaciers of Mount Rainier. So, Washington State's ecotourism of glaciers is yet another way glaciers vastly affect humans. Thanks for the virtual tour, Greg. We really enjoyed it. Now we'll let you get back to freezing. We can't wait to see your pictures. See you back at the bait shop next week. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. So glaciers might move very slowly, but they definitely are movers and shapers. Hey, if we don't start moving and shaking on this homework, our grades are really going to drop. Yeah, into a crevasse. Corny. So, Rick. Hi. Hi. What are you doing over here? <laughs> <laughs> you stuck your hand on it. I thought you wanted to shake my hand. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> like the Rockies or the Swift Alps. Continental and glacial are the two major types of glade landscape. <laughs> Continental and Alpine. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Where were you, Bo? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Bye, Greg. <laughs> To learn more, visit the Tackle Box website.